Okay, uh, hi everyone, it's great to, to be here. Thanks for the uh, invitation. Um, okay, so I'm gonna do, uh, present some work that uh, essentially spans over a series of paper that uh, includes work with a bunch of people from the University of Lille, from INRIA, from EPFL, and from the University of uh, Saint-Étienne. Okay, so we are in the ML at the Edge session, so we are concerned with uh, connected devices. Uh, so those devices, as like we've seen, they, uh, they are spreading rapidly and they are collecting increasingly personal data about their users. Uh, we've seen uh, several examples of that in the previous talks, like browsing logs, health data, speech data, accelerometer, geolocation, and so on. Okay, so on the one hand, this creates an opportunity to provide better personalized services uh, to users, but this is also a potential threat to their privacy. And so the first step to try and reconcile those two aspects is, is to operate in a setting where we keep and process data on uh, the user device. Um, so as far as AI and ML on the edges is concerned, uh, I think there are at least two settings of interest. Uh, most of previous talks have considered the problem of inference uh, on the edge, where essentially you have already trained a model uh, maybe on the cloud and you're pushing this model to user devices and then you're trying to essentially run uh, this model on device in a, an efficient and, and accurate manner. Okay, uh, in this talk I want to focus on the problem of training on the edge, which was also uh, the focus on the previous talk, where uh, you don't have an ML uh, model in the first place, you want to train it on the data across a large number of devices. Okay. And so the, the challenge then becomes uh, being able to design training algorithms that can operate in that setting, scale to a very large number of devices, uh, not being slowed down too much by communication and synchronization issue. So, okay, if you want to train uh, machine learning models over a uh, large number of devices, you have to think about what kind of network architecture you're gonna use. Um, so there are maybe two, two, two main options uh, that uh, are quite popular right now. The first one is uh, known as the federated learning setting where um, you have a central server that essentially coordinates the process, is connected to every device, and the central server would typically initialize the model, uh, send the model to the devices, the devices would uh, compute an update of the model based on that data, and then send back this update, the server aggregates it, and, and so on. Okay, so. Having this server, of course, is quite convenient from a sort of design perspective, but it has shortcomings, and in particular, it represents a single point of failure, and it may even become a bottleneck uh, when the number of devices becomes very large. Um, an alternative is the fully decentralized setting, uh, so you recognize something similar to um, what Anastasia presented uh, before. So in this case, you remove the central server uh, completely, and you rely on asynchronous device-to-device -device communication, uh, in a sparse net network graph, so this means that uh, any one device will only need to exchange messages with a very small number of other devices in the network, and yet the information will propagate in, the, in, in that network. And so this uh, enables the design uh, uh, algorithms that naturally scale to uh, many devices. So on both uh, federated learning and decentralized learning, I recommend uh, this uh, very recent survey, which was a community effort. Uh, among uh, many people that covers essentially both those uh, settings and also discusses open uh, problems. Um, there is a second choice probably to, to make here is what kind of model do we want to learn? Um, and what I mean here is uh, one option is to learn a global model. This was, uh, for example, the focus on, of Anast Anastasia's talk, uh, where you essentially trying to learn a model which will be the same for all devices. We'll make predictions for all devices, okay, in a, in a kind of one-size-fits-all uh, manner. Um, in this case, the model, of course, should be trained across data from all devices because it will generally help performance and, and make accurate predictions on average for users. Um, note, however, that having heterogeneous data across devices can slow down quite quickly in practice these, these algorithms. Um, and then uh, probably you also need a large model size, so many parameters, so that you can capture the specificities uh, of each user. Uh, on the other hand, one can try to learn more personalized models. So in this case, uh, you're learning a different model for each device. Uh, and in this case, each personalized model should not be trained on the entire set of users. It should be trained on the data from that user, but also in order to generalize well from essentially data that is coming from similar users, okay? And of course, finding these similar users 
uh, is quite challenging and we typically don't know that uh, in advance, who is similar to who. Um, of course, uh, a, a positive uh, point about those personalized models is that typically they can be much smaller because they take care of only being accurate on that particular user data. Uh, and so they are cheaper to, they are easier to fit on devices, they are uh, cheaper to communicate updates for, and, and so on. So what I'm going to present is an approach where we learn such personalized models um, in a fully decentralized setting. And what we're going to do is essentially learn who to communicate with uh, by inferring a graph of similarities uh, between users. Okay, so we identify essentially a graph of who is similar to who so that we don't waste uh, communication, sort of exchanging information between users that in fact have nothing in common in the learning objective. Uh, and then we can learn uh, collaboratively some personalized models over this graph such that the models are personalized but yet they take into account information from similar users. And we're going to optimize uh, the models and the graph in a, in a joint manner by an alternating optimization scheme. All right, so I hope this is clear and now we're going to uh, dive a bit into the specifics, uh, in particular how we uh, formulate the problem. Um, so we're going to have a set of n users uh, or devices um, and here I want to make clear that we are sh uh, all those devices are going to have data and they are going to share the feature space X, okay, so they have uh, agreed on some description of data points, uh, uh, typically a bunch of features and also the label space is, is shared, okay, so this is in this case a supervised learning task. Um, and uh, what the user I uh, has locally is some training data set, SI, essentially couples of uh, features uh, and, and labels uh, of size MI, so this size is specific to uh, this device, okay, because some devices might have, in practice in many applications may have much more data than others. Um, and the goal of each user is to learn a model, so this is a bunch of parameters here theta i in RP, okay, so those may be the parameters of a linear model or the weights of a deep neural net. Um, and of course the user is interested in learning a model that uh, generalizes well to future data from his device, okay. Uh, of course we have a very simple baseline in this setting which is learning in, in isolation, okay. You can ask each device to learn a local model only looking at its own data and in this case there is no communication needed. And in this case, you would try to minimize some local loss uh, Li, okay, which is small if the theta parameter is good at predicting the, the data from user I. Okay, so of course, this will not typically generalize very well uh, because local data is, is typically scarce. So there is a need for collaboration to improve upon this very simple baseline by essentially communicating. Okay, so uh, like I said before, we're gonna use a decentralized uh, network architecture so I want to be a little bit more precise in terms of uh, what that means in practice. So it means we will work in the asynchronous time model. So essentially you can see each device as becoming active at random times, asynchronously and in parallel in the network. So there is no global synchronization at all. And I'm just going to use a global counter T uh, just for analysis to denote the TF uh, activation of the device. Okay. And then in terms of communication, we're going to assume that in principle all users can exchange messages. Uh, but we want to restrict the communication on uh, pairs of users that are most similar so that we don't waste uh, messages and communication. And so we're going to mod model this by learning uh, what we call a collaboration graph, uh, which is a weighted graph with where the edge weight uh, WIJ reflects the similarity between the learning task of user I and J. Okay? So now I can introduce the objective function, uh, which is again joint over the models and uh, the graph weights. So the models are a big matrix n times p, okay, one model, one p-dimensional uh, model uh, by uh, user. And then the graph weights is a vector and we have as many entries as we have pairs of uh, devices. And essentially this objective function um, models a trade-off between two, two main terms, the blue one and the, the red one. The blue one is simply, if you ignore for now the, the weighting in front of the loss, uh, Li, it's essentially the sum of the local losses using uh, the, each user model on its device, its personalized model. So this is sort of doesn't implement any collaboration. We're just trying to have models that work well locally. Uh, and then the second term is what uh, enables collaboration. And essentially what it does is that it's trying to have 
closed models, so similar model parameters for users that are strongly connected in the collaboration graph, okay, when WIJ is, is large. Okay, I want to insist on uh, this confidence uh, uh, that we have in the blue part. So this thing is essentially proportional to the size of the training set of user i. This is to make sure that users with a lot of data, they will trust more the local loss and uh, not uh, incorporate too much information from neighbors because they can generalize well enough. And on the other hand, users with small data sets, they should not trust their local loss that much and they should incorporate more information from other uh, devices. Okay, so th this term is very important in practice. There is a last term at the end, which is a G of W, which is essentially regularization on the graph weights. I'll come back to that later. This is essentially to avoid having a trigger graph, like zero graph, uh, and also to encourage sparsity so that the collaboration graph that we uh, learn uh, doesn't connect too many uh, devices together. Uh, lastly, I want to uh, emphasize that this uh, objective function encodes quite flexible relationships. So if you look at the hyperparameter uh, mu here, essentially, uh, if you set it to zero, uh, you get the simple baseline where everybody is learning on its own, purely local models. And then if you make mu go to infinity, then the red term becomes a hard equality constraints for models in the same shared in the same connected component. So if you do that, you're going to essentially use global models, but one for each connected component of the, the graph. Right, so we have this uh, opti optimization problem with two types of uh, parameters to, to learn, and so we're going to solve this by alternating optimization, which is a natural approach. So essentially you initialize one, maybe W, and then you uh, optimize the models given the graph, and then you fix the models and you optimize the graph, and, and so on. Okay, so to do this, we need two components. We need a decentralized algorithm to learn the models given the graph, and then one to learn the graph given the models. So this is what I'm gonna get into now, uh, starting by learning models given the graph. Since here the graph is fixed, we can fix the neighborhood of the user i, so we denote that by ni, okay? Uh, so the neighborhood is just the set of uh, users, uh, devices J, that have non-zero weight with uh, user I. Uh, we can initialize the models to whatever, arbitrary uh, value, and then the algorithm goes as follows. You're, you're going to see it's, it's quite simple. I teach step T. Remember, there is a random user that becomes active, uh, and remember that this happens sort of asynchronously and in parallel in the network. And then when this user i becomes active, the user will update its model, only its personalized model, based on its local data and the information from neighbors. Uh, so in this update, you see two parts, like in the joint objective function that we had, some local gradient step, uh, which is trying to make the model better on the local data, uh, combined with a weighted average of the neighbors' models, uh, so that uh, the, this uh, device uh, get a model that is also closer on average to the the neighbors, okay? Uh, so it's a very simple update, and then the, the user that updated his model just notifies, essentially sends the model to, the, to its uh, neighbors so that they are uh, aware of the last version of the model that they can themselves use when they uh, become active and update. Okay, so I hope this is clear. We can show that this algorithm does what we want, meaning that it optimizes our objective, and we can show a rate. So this is an example of rate that we can get when the local losses are strongly convex. What this means essentially is that uh, if you run the algorithm for T iterations, so after T uh, devices, uh, T activations of dev devices, the expected uh, optimality gap that you get essentially is shri shrinking by a constant factor at each iteration. Okay, so essentially it decreases exponentially fast with, with T. Something else which is uh, quite important in practice is that if you set the number of updates per user to a constant number that doesn't depend on N, you get roughly uh, also a constant optimality gap. So this means you can make the number of devices grow uh, uh, arbitrarily large. If you keep the number of per device updates uh, constant, you're, you're fine. So the device don't need to do more work if there are more uh, devices in the network. Now let me quickly tell you about learning the graph given the models, uh, which is the missing step. Uh, this is just uh, copying the original objective function, and uh, I'm highlighting the last term that we had left away, this g of w, because it depends only on w. Uh, the algorithm that I'm going to present can deal with a large family of functions g, but here I'm going to show one. Um, specifically, uh, because it has quite interesting property. 
uh, essentially, again, we have two terms. We have a log barrier uh, term on the degrees of the node. So the degree of a node is just the sum of its weights. And if it is zero, it means this node is connected to no one. Okay, and if, it, if that happens, essentially this part of the uh, objective will shoot to infinity. Okay, because of the log. So uh, this way we present isolating users in, in the graph. Uh, and then the blue term will allow us to control the graph sparsity. Uh, by increasing beta, you're going to spread the weights uh, across more neighbors and so connect nodes in, in, on average to, to more people. So we can trade off uh, this. And in particular, remember that when we learn the model, this sparsity of the graph group gives us essentially how many messages nodes have to, uh, to send. Uh, so it's uh, nice to control this, uh, this directly. Okay, and uh, we get essentially in, in this step a strongly convex objective in, in W. So this is also good for optimization purposes. Um, how do we design an algorithm? So here it's a little bit different than before. We are trying to update the graph. So we cannot just send messages across the edges of the graph because this is the, the, the thing that we want to update. Okay, we want uh, devices to be able to discover new devices that they don't, that they haven't connected to before that might be more similar than the ones that they know. Uh, so for this, we essentially we use uh, decentralized system primitive, which is called peer sampling. Uh, so peer sampling allows essentially devices in a, in a decentralized network to draw a, a set of random peers uh, in the network in a uniform way. Okay, so this is well uh, described uh, primitive in the systems literature, so we just reuse this as a sort of capability to design our uh, algorithm. We can initialize the weights at the starting uh, point of the algorithm. We choose a parameter kappa, which is the size of the uh, random set of devices that, uh, that we're going to draw. And then at each step, uh, as before, we have a random user that becomes active. It's going to draw a set of kappa users with the peer uh, sampling service. And it's going to request their model, their loss, and their current degree. And essentially, based on this, they have in, uh, the device has enough information to do uh, an update of the associated weights, only the weights with those kappa users using a gradient update. So for clarity here, I didn't uh, write what uh, gradient update looks like, but essentially the user has enough information to compute it. And then it can just notify each uh, neighbor, each of the kappa neighbors too, uh, so that they are aware of the new weight. Okay, so it's again quite simple. Uh, and we have again some kind of uh, convergence rate. I'm not gonna go into the details here, uh, but just, uh, just note that the, the kappa parameter we can use to trade off between communication cost and conversion speed. So this is convenient in practice to make the algorithm scalable to the particular network of, of interest. Uh, we have worked also on uh, some extensions that I'm not going to talk about in detail. Uh, we can also reduce communication uh, when we update the models uh, by using a greedy boosting strategy. Um, so the, the problem here is similar to the one addressed by Anastasia in her talk, but the solution is different. So instead of taking dense updates and trying to sparsify them, uh, we essentially design the algorithm so that the updates are naturally sparse, and so we can just communicate them very uh, cheaply. Um, and then another uh, topic is how you can have formal uh, privacy guarantees, and so you can modify the algorithm uh, so that you get different privacy guarantees. So those are very strong guarantees that whatever, everything that uh, any device is sharing with others uh, doesn't allow to reconstruct essentially precisely uh, the, the training data, which might be very uh, sensitive. Uh, I'll show a few uh, numerical experiments. Um, so this is an experiment on synthetic data. This is essentially to showcase the kind of like topology that we can recover automatically without knowing the underlying uh, task structure. So here we had uh, created data such that uh, essentially, we have uh, all the user tasks. Uh, they, they are organized in some kind of cluster, where inside the cluster, uh, users have essentially not the same, but somewhat similar task. Uh, and what we want to do is run our algorithm and see if we can recover a similar structure. And so only based on uh, not knowing, of course, this, uh, this information and only knowing uh, small training samples for each uh, device, we can recover something like this which is also seen as the graph here, where you can see that we can approximately recover those four clusters. Um, and when we train personalized models over this uh, learned graph, the prediction accuracy we get is essentially very close to what we 
obtain if we use this oracle graph that, of course, we don't know in practice. And uh, I just want to show quickly some uh, experiments on real data sets. So those are data sets where the data is naturally collected at the user device uh, level. So the first data set here, for instance, is a mobile activity recognition where uh, the data is collected through uh, mobile sensors, which uh, differ a lot from a mobile phone to, to the next. So it's quite a personalized task. The number of uh, devices or users in this data sets, they go from 23 to 190. Uh, there's no task similarity available, so we don't know, and we have to learn that. Uh, and we learn both linear models and nonlinear ensembles. And what, uh, what we have is, uh, so this is the, essentially the linear models. Those are the nonlinear ensembles. And we have two natural baselines, the purely local models that I talked about before, where everybody learns in isolation, and uh, learning a global model which is optimized across all uh, devices. Okay, so this is the standard, maybe, approach of learning a global model. And what we see in practice is that we can, in many of these data sets, outperform both the global models and the purely local ones. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I'll end here, and thanks a lot. Uh, I'm happy to take questions. Questions? Or well, maybe, Aurelien, you can tell us more about these privacy guarantees that you were mentioning as uh, the next possible work extension for this work. Right. So we have actually done some of that already. So this was this extension that I mentioned uh, somewhere. OK. Uh, OK, so some differential privacy guarantees. So. I guess it will be hard without slide to explain formally what differential privacy is for people who, who don't know about it. But those are, okay, some, some kind of gold standard right now for, for privacy. And what you have to do to make the algorithm uh, private is to essentially add, um, add some random perturbations to the updates of the models. And so this always creates uh, essentially a trade-off between the privacy guarantee and the kind of accuracy that you get. And I think I have the, maybe a backup figure just to show that. Yeah, this is what we can get, essentially. Uh, so what you hope by doing this is that uh, you can do, by enforcing this privacy, you can, of course, you know you're not going to do as good as the non-private algorithm. So by non-private, I mean not adding this additional noise, the, the algorithm that I presented in these slides. Um, but of course, you would like to still do better than purely local models, because those don't communicate anything. So in, in a sense, they are perfectly private. And so what this shows in practice is that you can do a good trade-off. So you can release a bit more information than nothing, but still get good guarantees. So this is the parameter of this differential privacy definition. The smaller, the, 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 the best uh, privacy guarantee. And you can see that you can get the best of both worlds in, in a way by getting both privacy and, and, and more accurate models than not communicating. Question here. Yeah. So thank you for talk. Um, Andreas Blank from Technical University of Munich. I have actually two questions. So the first one is like, what is really the killer use case for decentralized learning at the edge? So I mean, I, I learn something, maybe I get a model, and for me as a private user, maybe my model is not changing from this task in the future anymore. So when I have done this one time, in which case really do I need this? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, so there are applications, obviously, where you have to do this in this decentralized manner, where you have essentially some kind of sensor kind of deployment that collect data but cannot, for physical reason, communicate with everybody in the network. Uh, but we think it is also a, a, a very good alternative to just this cloud-based uh, training, like more classic ferality learning approach, by this, uh, essentially, this scalability uh, that you can naturally scale to many devices. And so there are even some work in decentralized uh, learning that have shown that even in the data center, so I think some of the Anastasia's experiments were showing this, even in the data center, uh, you can be better off sort of uh, communicating in, in, in that way, even though this is not edge computing, it's just in the data center. OK, I mean, what are the timescales for these use cases you have in mind? I mean, how fast do I have to be on learning and these kinds of decentralized um, solutions? Uh, 
what's, so what's what? Because you, you talked about sensors, sensor networks. Uh -huh. Because my background is uh, network engineering. Um, yeah, what are the time scales you're talking about? Is it about seconds, milliseconds, minutes, hours? What for, is the use case? For training the model? Or? For, for the task that I have to train this kind of model. It's like, uh, do I have a factory where I have my robot arm and I have then multiple of them and they're learning something? Or for uh, end mobile devices? So I'm, I'm missing a little bit of the use case here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think I'm more thinking about the regular devices. So smartphones right now are a bit tough because it's not so easy to actually exchange data directly. Um, but apparently this is going to change with 5G, which is going to implement some, okay, more, uh, essentially, if you communicate with, with devices that are closer, this can be more efficient. Um, and in general, so we're thinking about like uh, edge uh, computing for those health kind of device in personalized me medicine, uh, where you can have a very large number of devices collecting data and uh, again, a very personalized uh, kind of task where you don't es essentially need to train a model, necessarily the same model on across all devices. Okay. Um, um, but, yeah. Maybe just one final question then. Um, because it's said like about privacy, I mean, we can also, when we, when we distribute the models, actually we can reverse engineer the data. Now when I have like my device, I'm getting the models from my neighbors. Now I'm able actually to reverse engineer the data in contrast, when everything was in the cloud, I cannot get the models. So how would you argue about that? Yeah, so this is precisely the purpose of having different privacy guarantees. Those guarantees, they essentially make sure that to some extent, so this depends, of course, of the pr privacy parameter that you're choosing, but to some extent, you can uh, prevent this from happening uh, and essentially bound the precision to which this re reconstruction can, can be done. So this has been shown in many applications, including like images and other stuff. Um, so yeah, this is the motivation for doing this. Make sure that other people that receive my updates cannot reconstruct uh, to some precision uh, my, my data. One last question, Brandon. So these are nice results, and I like the application of differential privacy. But if I want to go from a theoretical bound, which I would say epsilon is, to actually implementing this in practice, like how do I actually reason about epsilon? Like, what does it mean, right? Like, that's always a question with differential privacy. Yes. It's a bit unfair, but you're trying to provide strong guarantees. <laughs> um, that's a very good question, and in, indeed, uh, I think there's a question about differential privacy in, in, in general. Uh, I don't know if there's a very good answer. There has been some deployments, like recently with the U.S. Census Bureau, for instance, which have used, so the U.S. Census, starting 2020, I think, they're going to use differential privacy for every statistics that they release about uh, the U.S. Census. And so to tune this epsilon to provide, at the same time, meaningful guarantees and meaningful accuracy, they have used the past release to essentially tune, tune this. So you can do some of that if you have sort of historical data. Uh, another thing is to design attacks. So there's been some uh, quite development on membership inference attacks, for instance, uh, practical attacks that people try to pull on those models. This relates also to the, the previous question. And these attacks, they match pretty well to the guarantee that uh, different share privacy is trying to provide, essentially hide whether some particular data point was in the training set or not. And so using this, you can also see the effect in practice of setting the value of epsilon to something and then looking at how much adversaries can reconstruct. Okay, th that's it for the for the questions. If you if you want, uh, I'm sure you you will be able to ask uh, questions. You already are at the poster session. <laughs>